Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a wonderful day and uh, a great day tomorrow as well. Um, last night, Heidi and I had the opportunity to introduce folks uh, to the notion of child X, and, and we really emphasized uh, two issues, and I'd like to start the morning off by those same areas of emphasis. First, I'd like everyone to take a moment to consider why we're really here. What is the thrust of your attendance here? And I would submit that for each of us, it's because we want to have an impact on child health, uh, women's health, and the health of someone that has moved us. Uh, we want to focus on the children. And I'd like to encourage you just for one brief moment to hold in your mind's eye uh, the child or the children that have moved you, that continue to move you and continue to motivate you, that animate your efforts uh, towards cure, towards health, towards your work, towards your life, those children. When I uh, think of those children, I, I always think of uh, three or four different kids that I cared for in the context of my medical practice. I think of a young man who uh, I spent a lot of time with named Simon, who uh, passed away after a long struggle with chronic lung disease of infancy. I, I think of uh, two young women who I cared for for years with, uh, after lung transplantation. Uh, and, and I think of another young lady who told me when she was 15 or 16 that uh, she wasn't going to live till she was 18 and she's with cystic fibrosis and now she's 35 years old with two children. And, and these are the things that I think about that, that motivate me. And I recognize that uh, in many ways uh, the reasons I'm able to give such consideration to, to those children uh, is that uh, things have move forward in remarkable ways in the last 20 to 30 years. And this conference is really emblematic of that. It, its theme really owes to the concepts that uh, Dr. Leonard spoke of a few moments ago, where we look at the intersection of disciplines that used to be considered separate from one another. When we consider the greatest legacy of Stanford Medicine, which is a profound and great legacy, uh, we can see where places that didn't have obvious meeting points have been brought together. Uh, I always consider radiation oncology where we brought the linear accelerator to Stanford and that gave an opportunity for oncologists to talk to physicists, which led to the whole notion of irradiating cancers. Uh, I think of one of our keynote speakers uh, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, Steve Quake, whose biophysical uh, expertise in fundamental areas of physics uh, helped him to understand the biology of DNA such that we could measure fetal DNA in maternal blood and obviate the need for uh, amniocentesis. Uh, I consider even notions such as uh, ventilation of infants that uh, really started here as much as anywhere else where uh, Phil Sunshine, one of the fathers of neonatology, was uh, very closely engaged with uh, folks in pathology and uh, radiology. And those intersections are really what led us to this place right now, uh, which is Stanford Medicine, and even today uh, to where we're at relative to uh, this session, where we're really looking to identify these disciplines that collide with one another. Um, it's interdisciplinary. It's the intersection of policy, implementation science, fundamental biology, law, science, and medicine. I hope that uh, you'll be able to experience that through the course of the day and of tomorrow. So thank you for indulging my introduction. And uh, I'd like now to turn the microphone and the podium uh, over to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Tony weiss Corre. Uh, Tony's a, a remarkable scientist. Uh, he has uh, been at Stanford uh, for a couple of decades now. He is uh, Swiss uh, in background and education. Uh, Tony's a perfect example of this notion of meta-disciplinary. Uh, he uh, is a scientist who spends his uh, life working on issues related to uh, neurologic illness, e even illnesses such as Alzheimer's, which we wouldn't necessarily think would be that relevant to uh, this particular meeting. 
but how he has moved his science in, in ways uh, that have uh, really crafted a new field. In some ways, I think uh, Tony's uh, influence is so sustained and so uh, profound that uh, actually he was the motivating force in many ways, in my opinion, for an episode of Silicon Valley, the show, where um, we really had the uh, blood boy, who was a big part of the show. And uh, I'm going to let Tony explain how I came to that conclusion. And uh, I think that you'll be edified by him in, in many ways. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. So um, I, I'd like to start with this slide here and, and ask a um, show of hands of whoever had problems finding their car in a parking lot. <laughs> so hopefully you remember where you parked your car today. But um, it's, it's really uh, interesting that our brain um, is this really amazing supercomputer that can store information and retrieve it. If you're young and you park your car in a parking lot like this, you have the music turned on, you talk to your friends, you go shopping for a few hours and you come out, you never even think where you parked your car. Your brain steers you automatically to that parking lot. But as we get older, and I can certainly feel this already, it becomes more and more difficult to store these memories and retrieve them. And we use all kinds of um, helpers like um, a car alarm uh, on your key or, um, or the, the, the car parking lots are now painted in different colors to sort of help us uh, make this a little bit easier. But really what our brain does, it uses spatial cues such as a lamppost, a storefront to make these maps so that it can then retrieve them when it needs them. As we get older, these maps are harder to um, store and retrieve. And this is not something that is unique to humans, but animals have this as well, whether it's um, monkeys, non-human primates, dogs, but also mice. And I'll show you an example later on how we can take advantage of that. So this, this young brain, for some reason, as it gets older, starts to lose connections between uh, neurons, it starts to lose neurons and actually loses mass. If you're 90 years old, roughly, you have lost 100 grams of brain mass. That's, that's about 5% uh, or, or a bit more of the total volume of the brain. And the brain becomes more and more susceptible to degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and other uh, types of diseases. So, um, right now, if we live 85 years, um, about 55, of the, uh, 55 years of those are going to be healthy, and 30 years are going to be um, with all kinds of diseases, degenerative diseases often, but uh, it could be heart disease, it could be diabetes. And, and really, um, we're, we're trying to treat these diseases one at a time. But there is a very interesting sort of natural experiment in humans, and, and these individuals are called centenarians. These people live often over 100 years, um, and they have no diseases. Um, in fact, uh, there's often a joke, when, once they see a doctor, uh, then they become sick. Um, so these people live healthy. Um, of course, they get older, and they don't run around like a kid, but they um, are by all means healthy, and um, they die in a very short period of time. They get sort of uh, maybe they get a disease, and then they die within a year or two. So this would be really ideal if we could delay the age-related diseases and mimic sort of what we see in, in centenarians. Um, so um, what if we could extend this health span to maybe 75 years of age so that there would only be a shorter period of time? So this is really what people are trying to do in this uh, growing um, a field of, of aging research uh, that um, you probably see in the news. David mentioned an example of a, a, pop, a, a sort of popular media, but also a number of companies who are really starting now to tackle aging, not as a disease, but as an avenue to slow down age-related diseases or prevent age-related diseases. 
And that leads us to this ideal of the fountain of youth, uh, a painting here from Lucas Cranach, the elder, um, that shows how old and frail people enter this fountain of youth, this magical fountain, and then re-emerge, rejuvenated and young on the other side. Now, we know there is no such fountain uh, yet, um, but what I want to share with you is that, uh, at least in mice, it seems that we have the possibility to slow down or even reverse aspects of aging in multiple tissues, including in the brain. So this really started with a somewhat creepy model that is called parabiosis. Um, uh, that was actually invented um, over a hundred years ago to study tissue rejection, transplantation, later was used to study hormones, and basically what it is, is um, a, a model where you suture together two animals, their blood supplies join, and now you can study factors that go from one animal to another. Um, and um, Tom Randall here, who's a neurologist, uh, was actually the first to revive this to study muscle stem cells. He had a very specific question. So as we get older, our stem cells um, get exhausted to some extent, or they even disappear. And they're not as active in producing and regenerating tissues. And that's certainly the case in muscle. So if you're old and you, um, you do a very hard workout, um, or you injure your muscle, the stem cells don't get activated and they don't make muscle tissue. Whereas when you're young, you go to the gym, you work out really hard, that triggers muscle stem cells and they make muscle tissue. So Tom asks a very simple question. Is this because the muscle stem cells with age lack a factor inside, an intrinsic factor, or is it a factor from the outside? And that's how we use this model. And paired a young mouse with an old mouse to see whether factors from the young mouse could regenerate and reactivate that stem cell. And that was indeed the case. He worked together with Irv Weissman also here and Irina Conboy, who has now a lab at UC Berkeley. And they found that this old muscle can be repaired and rejuvenated by young blood, essentially. They also f found effects on the liver. Others then showed effects on the heart and pancreas. And Tom even saw that there's some signs of regeneration potentially in the brain. And that's really how our collaboration started. Now at the heart of all of this is really blood. Blood is the tissue that connects all the different organs in our body. It of course carries blood cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, but it also carries thousands and thousands of different other factors, many of them proteins. And these proteins carry information between the tissues. And I want to elaborate a bit on this. But what we can really ask now is whether blood actually ages. Can we look at blood and see what changes with age? And can we learn something from that? And, and so to, to, to explain this a bit, what we're trying to do, if you have um, two cells in our body and they can be in the same tissue or they could be distant in different tissues, the, the main mean of com communication between non-neuronal cells is by release of factors, and these are mostly proteins, that then bind to a receptor on another cell to trigger very specific responses. And this is really what biologists have been doing over the past 30 years, to try to understand these types of response, or maybe 50 years. And this could then instruct a cell to either survive, to divide, to differentiate, or even to die. And these signals are really, in a way, the language of cells. Like I talk to you here and use words, the cells in our body use different proteins to talk to each other. And examples of these are growth hormone, interferon, insulin, and so forth. But there's not just three, there's thousands. And what we're really trying to do now is to measure as many of these as we can, thousands of these proteins, to see how blood changes from very young to old, and whether we can learn something about the aging process and diseases um, using that approach. So here I give you an example of a blood-based signature of normal aging. Here we had plasma samples, so that is blood without the cells, from 400 individuals aged 20 to over 100. They were all healthy, they had no cognitive problems, they had no major diseases. And we measured 1,300 proteins in this language of cells to try to discover a signature of aging. 
And this is just a graphical representation of the results. So here on the x-axis, you have each individual from 20 to over 100. So each column would basically be an individual. And then we measured over 1,300 proteins in the y-axis. And we expressed the relative levels of these proteins with two colors uh, or a mix of these. So if you have low levels of a factor, that's blue. And if it's high, we show it as yellow. And you can see some of these proteins are expressed at low levels when you're young, and they increase as you get older. And others go the other direction. Some don't change at all. But we consistently find that roughly a third of all proteins change with age suggesting that our body lives in a very different environment when it comes to this language. So it has to almost constantly relearn how to adapt. It's not that the words disappear, but they may be much louder or softer, or they're slightly modified in ways that we're trying to understand. But what you also can do is you can actually model aging, and, uh, and this is shown here. So if we, if we use the top proteins that most strongly correlate with aging, we can take the levels of these factors for each individual and then calculate the relative age of a person. So this is shown here on the x-axis, you have the actual age of a person, the chronological age, and then for each individual, for each of these circles, we calculate what is your relative age, the hypothetical predicted biological age. Now I have to tell you, this is still work in progress, if we would predict the age perfectly, everybody would be on this 45 degree diagonal, right? But that would be boring. It would probably be wrong because we know people age differently. Uh, what we want to ask is this individual, for example, who is 70 years of age, but when we look at the factors that best characterize aging, we predict this individual is only 45 years of age. So is this a person who may live to 100, will not get any of the major age-related diseases, and maybe even looks younger? And then on the other hand, you have this individual here as an example, who is not even 40, but predicted to have a signature of a 65-year-old. Is this a person who has maybe already an underlying age-related diseases? It could even be cancer. Cancer is, uh, certainly many forms of cancer are age-related. And is that um, a person who will not live as long and maybe even looks older than they are? This is really what we're trying to understand and, and, and learn from what are these factors that characterize this aging signature and how do they do that? And are they involved in diseases of aging? But what I've shown you so far is all correlation, right? This is all, we just look how age correlates with the levels of these factors. And correlations are easy. You always read these nice stories where things correlate, but then somebody shows the opposite effect. So we really need causality. So we want to, sh we want to show whether these factors actually modulate aging. And that's really where we come back to this model um, that I showed you before, parabiosis. Um, but there's actually other ways to do this. And, and, and one way is to simply transfer blood from one animal to another. Now, this seems obvious, and you might ask, why didn't you do this in the first place? Well, because nobody would have thought that blood has an effect on aging. But what we found is by either suturing a young mouse with an old mouse together, or transferring small amounts of blood from a young mouse into an old, or in this case, from an old, old mouse into a young, we found, for example, in the brain, in, the, in young mice exposed to old blood, that they have less stem cell activity, they have less synaptic activity, so their neurons don't communicate as well with each other, they have impaired memory. So simply giving them old plasma impaired their memory function, and they have more inflammation in their brain. On the other hand, the old mouse that is exposed to young blood, either through this model called parabiosis, where the mice basically live side by side for a few weeks, or by transferring small amounts of young blood, young plasma into old mice, we can increase stem cell activity. We can increase the activity that neurons talk with each other, both at 
at, at molecular and, and electrophysiological levels, so functional levels. We can reduce brain inflammation, and most importantly, these mice are actually smarter. They can remember uh, better. So the functional consequences of this are uh, shown here in an example of a memory test that we do. This is sort of the parking lot test for a mouse. <laughs> it's a little bit modified um, to make it uh, feasible, but basically we put mice on a table that has a lot of holes, and the, the table is, uh, is open, it's, there's a bright light shining on it, and the mice are scared. They want to escape from this. And we show them one hole, shown by this red arrow, where we mount a tube underneath, and the mice are taught to find this hole and escape into that tube. They, they feel more comfortable there. To do that, they need to be able to use spatial cues. We give them a checkerboard, a rectangle, and so forth, like we use as a, a lamppost or a storefront to make our uh, map. These mice can make maps in this maze using the cues that we give them here. And so we put these mice on this table, and if they're smart enough, they will remember where the hole is and will find the hole. But when they're old, they can't really do that. And so in this first movie, we see an old mouse that was treated with um, a controlled saline solution, or we could also give it old plasma. And this mouse uh, can basically not find uh, this escape hole that, that we prepared for it. Now, the next mouse is the same age mouse. It, it, it's a, a litter mate, um, but it was treated with um, small amounts of actually human cord plasma. So we inject these mice with roughly 7% of the total blood volume of uh, cord plasma every three days for three weeks. And then we test them here. And look how this mouse even shows a different behavior from, from the beginning. It's almost as if it orients itself. Where am I? It's the best mouse we ever had. <laughs> really smart mouse. So when you look at this statistically, we, we, we train the mice for four days, four trials per day. And um, these mice at the beginning, so these are the control mice. They really have a hard time understanding what they're supposed to, to do and to learning this paradigm. And you saw a movie of this. They basically don't learn. Now, we could make it a bit easier, and then they would show some learning effect, but we really want to see the differences here. And we, initially, we have to teach them what to do. We sort of shove them to this hole so that they get the, the point. Um, but then, in contrast, in the, the red lines here um, are the mice that are treated with core plasma. And you see there's already trends on the second and third day, depending on experiments, sometimes even significant effects. But they're clearly on the fourth day, um, we actually, I forgot to say, we change the location of this escape hole every day. It's really difficult. Um, and that's why on the first trial, uh, even on the fourth day, they don't know yet where the hole is going to be. But on the second trial, they can already remember where it is. So they're really smart. A young mouse, uh, in comparison, would do this job maybe in, in 30 seconds. But we can, of course, try and, and play with giving them more plasma, more frequently, but still we get sort of halfway to a younger mouse, right? Now, when I presented these data, neurologists encouraged me to test this in humans because plasma is given to people all the time, as you know. And so we did a proof of concept study, Sharon Shah here uh, in the Department of Neurology actually uh, did this test. Um, sponsored by a company that we started, Alkahest. And what we decided to do is to do, a, first of all, a, a, a small phase one safety trial and just see can old people to tolerate uh, young plasma. So we had 18 patients, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. We treated them with roughly 5% of the total plasma volume per treatment. Uh, so one unit uh, of plasma once a week for four weeks. Now the mice were treated um, every three days for three weeks, so we gave them eight to ten treatments, but that's of course hard to do in humans. 
And moving forward, we actually have a, a regimen where we do daily treatments for uh, six, five days or six days, um, rather than these um, uh, uh, sort of um, more uh, s uh, uh, treatments that are that are less uh, frequent. And, it ha and the reason why we do this is it has been uh, very hard to actually keep people in this trial um, for for many visits because we wanted them also. It was sort of a, a trial where we treated people either with plasma or with a sham control, and then switch them over uh, to another treatment after a washout period. So they had to come 10 or 12 times, and that was a bit uh, complicated. But we had uh, standard assessments um, of these patients, daily activity of living, memory tests, functional brain imaging, and blood tests. And um, what we found is that um, it was safe, we didn't have any unexpected adverse events, and surprisingly, we even saw statistically significant effects on what are called daily activities of living. So this is, uh, for example, buttoning a shirt or brushing your teeth, things that are assessed by the caregiver, but that might be quite important. But I have, of course, caution that this is a very small trial, it's only 18 individuals, um, and we can't predict what uh, the phase two or fa uh, possible phase three would look like, but it's certainly encouraging. So the, the big question is how do we translate this into effective treatments for millions of people with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, or other uh, age-related diseases? Um, and what we really want to do is we want to uh, understand this language that cells use to communicate each with each other, not just to understand age, aging and age-related diseases, but remember I showed you that young mice exposed to old factors do actually worse. So this could potentially be important even for children, and we actually uh, study now a model of a, of a genetic childhood disease where we see that factors that are associated with aging have also detrimental effects in these models. So we can go both ways by understanding the signature. We don't learn just about our normal aging process, but potentially also about factors that could be detrimental early on and be relevant for children. We want to understand the genetic basis of how do these factors rejuvenate an old brain, for example, or other tissues, and why um, are maybe some people aging faster uh, than others? Can we study the genetic basis of this rejuvenating effect and learn from that? And then find key proteins and genes. We have already identified a number of those. Uh, we have identified factors that are pro-aging, and we identified factors that seem to have beneficial or rejuvenating effects and we published these findings uh, over the past few years, and then study these proteins in model systems such as mice. We also work now in a very exciting new genetic model that is called a killifish. Um, this is in close collaboration with Anne Brunet here, who developed this really as a model to study aging. And this fish has a lifespan of only about five months, so we can study uh, genes and, and, and factors that have an effect on aging uh, very quickly, whereas a mouse still lives three years roughly and becomes very expensive and also timely, not really feasible to do lifespan studies or study prominent effects on aging. And then, of, of course, the ultimate goal is to test such factors in humans and see whether they have clinical utility. So I would like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge uh, the people who, uh, in my lab who, who really did the work, uh, as well as many collaborations from collaborators from here, uh, from the university, and then funding from, from these sources. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, so much. Um, there's going to be time for questions. As I think uh, you recall, uh, Dr. Leonard uh, informed you of the app. And so if you want to start thinking about your questions, uh, they're going to be collated uh, in the back, and uh, we'll be able to see what the relative number of people asked given questions, and we'll ask accordingly. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Michelle Manji, who is a pediatric neurologist. And uh, Dr. Manji is going to uh, really uh, address 
aspects of brain development and really the importance, the central importance of the microenvironment of the brain, uh, both uh, in terms of development and in terms of the immune biology of the brain relative to brain cancers. Uh, Dr. Uh, Manji is really um, a tremendously accomplished pediatric neurologist in addition to running a developmental biology uh, and immunobiology laboratory that's uh, dedicated to neurobiology. Uh, she has spent a good amount of time at Stanford. She got her uh, MD and her PhD here after attending uh, Vassar as an undergraduate. Uh, Dr. Manji is accomplished in uh, a whole host of arenas, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce her today. Thank you, Dr. Manji. Thank you. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here today to speak with you. I am a developmental neurobiologist by training, as well as a pediatric neuro-oncologist. I, I take care of children with brain tumors. And both my clinical practice, as well as my basic science laboratory, is really very focused on this group of diseases, malignant gliomas of childhood. These tumors are the leading cause of cancer-related death in children. And we have made almost no headway over the last five to six decades in treating these diseases. In many ways, this cancer does not fit our conceptual framework for cancer. And so we need a fundamentally new approach to understand and ultimately treat this terrible group of diseases. My basic science laboratory focuses on deciphering the molecular mechanisms the language, if you will, that cells use to communicate with each other as they work together to build and remodel the brain so that we can understand the way that these mechanisms of development and plasticity go wrong in childhood brain cancer. And so I'm going to tell you one story today about the way in which mature neurons, the electrically active cells in the brain, interact both with the normal glial cells that form what's called the myelin sheath, and the way that these neurons communicate with malignant glia in the context of childhood brain cancer. <clears throat> By way of review, I want to tell you about one of my, my, my favorite neurobiological and developmental processes, which is called myelination. And this is the process by which a glial cell type called oligodendrocytes ensheath the axonal membrane to just decrease the transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction. This is quite literally the insulation around the wires in the brain that allow communication to occur on a millisecond time scale. Myelination in the human central nervous system is a fascinating process. Human infants are born with very little myelin established. This really develops after birth. And as you can see here, the black stain is showing you uh, myelination. And this, these are images taken from a study back in the 1920s. We've known for a long time that infants are born with very little myelin, and then through very predictable topographical and chronological patterns, myelination proceeds in the central nervous system. And what's truly fascinating is that this process in the human brain extends over more than 30 years. And there are regions of the brain, like the neocortex and the connections between cortical regions so important for higher cognitive function, where myelination remains somewhat incomplete, as though there's some inherent tunability to this particular system. And this is important not only because it's fascinating itself, but also because high-grade or malignant gliomas of childhood occur in a spatiotemporal pattern at certain places in the brain at certain ages that maps almost perfectly onto developmental waves of myelination. Pontine glioma happens when the pons is undergoing a discrete wave of myelination. Frontal and cortical glioblastoma happens when those fibers in the frontal cortex are myelinating. And this is concordant with observations initially from my laboratory and subsequently by others that these tumors, in fact, may arise from precursors of the cells that form myelin, called oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And this fits with our subsequent discoveries in studying these tumors, that the tumor cells very closely resemble the precursors to these myelin-forming cells. 
And so we may glean important lessons about pediatric glioma pathogenesis by better understanding what typically or normally regulates the proliferation and subsequent differentiation of these myelin-forming cells. So one idea that had been in the literature for some time, first introduced in the early 90s by Ben Barris and then supported by really beautiful um, in vitro or petri dish work uh, by many others, was the idea that neurons themselves could regulate the extent to which their axons, their wires, are myelinated. And that this may be in an activity or experience-dependent way. And while this is a very attractive hypothesis that kind of you know, really plays into this idea that myelination is so prolonged and potentially modulated by experience, it, it had remained quite a controversial idea and had never really been shown in the living and functioning brain. And so when I began my laboratory here at Stanford about six years ago, I set out to determine whether or not neuronal activity does regulate myelination, whether this insulating infrastructure of our brain could be adaptable and plastic. And so to do that, we used a, a really cool set of techniques developed by others here at Stanford called optogenetics. And this is um, a technique that gives us the ability to control neuronal activity of neurons that we've engineered to express a light-sensitive ion channel, in this case called channel rhodopsin 2. And you can see by this circling mouse, if we stimulate the neurons in a motor planning area of the brain, we can effectively elicit complex motor activity. And that tells us that we have elevated the activity of those neurons, and then we can ask very straightforward questions about how other cells in that region respond to elevations in neuronal activity. And what we found was that normal oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the precursors to these myelin-forming glial cells, rapidly and robustly increase their proliferation in response to elevations in neuronal activity. And then over time, those cells differentiate into functional myelinating oligodendrocytes. And the myelin sheath, this insulation around the wire, changes. It becomes thicker in a way that should increase the speed of neural impulse conduction. Now, if you change the speed with which neurons communicate with each other, this can change circuit function and could change behavior. And indeed, what we found was that the mice exhibited better motor performance in a way that depended upon making these new oligodendrocytes. And so what is emerging is a really exciting new principle of neuroplasticity by which experience modulates brain structure and therefore function at the level of the insulating infrastructure of the brain. And this is a, a principle that has a number of really important implications. And right now in my laboratory, we're testing whether these changes in myelination that can be experience and brain activity dependent could play important roles in learning and other forms of cognition. We're testing whether we can harness the mechanisms that mediate this communication between neurons and glial cells to promote regeneration after white matter injury, such as the demyelinating injury that happens in multiple sclerosis. And finally, there are a range of implications for dysfunction or dysregulation of this powerful physiology in a number of neurological and neuropsychiatric diseases. Well, the disease that my laboratory focuses the most on is childhood brain cancer. And so we wanted to understand, could neuronal activity similarly promote the proliferation of malignant glial cells the way that it promotes the proliferation of these normal oligodendrocyte precursor cells? This was a particularly compelling idea for me in light of a, a hallmark of these childhood gliomas called perineuronal satellitosis. Pathologists have known for almost 100 years that the tumor cells really like to cluster around mature neurons in the microenvironment. And this suggests that there may be some degree of a relationship between those cells. I want to point out that this particular image comes from an autopsy specimen of a five-year-old patient of mine and that his tumor donation enabled my laboratory to make the very first cell culture and mouse model of this kind of cancer. Much of the work that we do in our lab is enabled by similar such tissue donations, by patients, by children, and their families who don't want future children 
to experience what they have. And so to test whether neuronal activity similarly influences the growth of childhood gliomas, we did the same experiment that I just told you about, optogenetically stimulating the activity of neurons in the motor planning area, but this time in the context of a childhood glioma diffusely infiltrating that area we, that we transplanted there. And what we found was that indeed, these malignant glial cells increase proliferation in response to neuronal activity, and this results in a circuit-specific increase in cancer growth. Brain activity is promoting brain cancer growth. To begin to understand how this may be true, what the mechanisms are, what the molecular language is with which neurons are communicating with these cancer cells, we did what we call a secreted factor screen. We took acute slices of healthy mouse brain, and then we looked at uh, conditions with differing levels of neuronal activity. Either we stimulated neuronal activity optogenetically, or we allowed the slices to proceed with the kind of spontaneous neuronal activity that occurs, or we silenced neuronal activity. And what we found was that when we took the media bathing those brain slices that contains the factors they secrete as a result of activity and place them onto childhood brain tumor cells in a dish, that there was a really robust increase in tumor cell proliferation in response to the active condition medium. And that that effect was totally blocked if we silenced neuronal activity uh, using pharmacological strategies. Remarkably, because my lab really focuses on these childhood gliomas, we found that this mechanism extended to multiple forms of glioma, not just pediatric gliomas and multiple forms of pediatric gliomas, but also to the major forms of adult glioma. So this appears to be a conserved mechanism across this class of cancers. We did, a, I'm, I'm digging into the weeds here because I want to, to take you through the journey of discovery towards a, sort of a hopeful new direction. And as we analyzed what was in that condition medium, biochemically and proteomically, we discovered that there were two important mechanisms. And this, I know, just looks like a bunch of letters, but one is an activity-regulated neurotrophin called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. But the other mechanism that we discovered was really surprising. It was a secreted form of a synaptic protein called neuroligin-3, which functions as a very powerful uh, mitogen or promoter of proliferation for these glioma cells. So what is neuroligin-3? Well, it's a really well-known postsynaptic adhesion molecule, meaning that it helps to keep the connections between neurons together. And when neuroligin-3 is dysfunctional, neurons don't communicate with each other as well. They also don't form connections well. Neuroligin-3 plays an important role in what we call synaptogenesis, or the formation of these um, interneuronal connections. Neuroligin-3 is also a very well-studied molecule because when mutated, it's responsible for certain familial forms of autism. So this is a very well-known synaptic protein that was not previously known to be uh, a promoter of proliferation or a growth factor in any way, and actually wasn't even known to be released. Uh, but we find that its release is strictly activity-dependent, and when we dig in to the details and figure out the mechanism by which it's being released, we find that it's being clipped, cleaved and released in an activity-dependent way at the membrane, and that there's a particular enzyme called ADAM10 that is responsible for this cleavage and release of neuroligin-3 into the tumor microenvironment. So how important is this mechanism? There are many ways by which cancers can grow. And so we wanted to test the relative importance of this mechanism, of neuroligin-3 activity-regulated release into the childhood brain tumor microenvironment. To test this, what we did was we took human tumor cells, human uh, pediatric glioma cells, and we transplanted them to the environment of the neuroligin-3 deficient brain using a knockout mouse model. And instead of seeing a slowing of growth, which was what we expected, instead, we surprisingly found a complete stagnation of growth. These tumors could not grow without this mo molecule in the microenvironment. And this was true 
for up to six months, at which, at which point a subset of the tumors find a way to get around this apparently complete dependency on this synaptic protein in the microenvironment. So this was totally surprising. I made my graduate student do this experiment at least six times before I believed it. And then we started testing it in, uh, with other tumors. What I just showed you was a pediatric glioblastoma that had arisen in the cortex and we placed in the cortex. We then looked at pontine gliomas. We looked at different brain regions. We looked at adult glioblastoma. In all of these gliomas, they could not grow without this molecule in the microenvironment. We also looked then at an adult model of patient-derived breast cancer brain metastasis, and that could grow just fine. In, in the absence of neuroligin-3. So this appears to be a mechanism that is conserved across gliomas, but does not extend necessarily to other cancers. So I've just told you that neuroligin-3 is unexpectedly important for tumor growth, and my entire laboratory is trying to figure out why it's so important right now. But I also told you that we, decide, we determined that this particular enzyme, ADAM10, mediates its release into the tumor microenvironment. So while we're figuring out this surprising result, and this may take us decades to understand why neuroligin-3 is so necessary for growth, we immediately went to test the therapeutic potential of blocking ADAM10 to prevent release of neuroligin-3 into the tumor microenvironment. And excitingly, we found that that's a promising strategy, at least in our mouse models, that recapitulates the degree of growth stagnation that we see when neuroligin-3 is missing from the brain. Really fortunately, this is a strategy that we may be able to translate quickly because there are existing inhibitors of this enzyme. So I don't want to go through all of the details, but we've been digging in to try to understand why neuroligin-3 seems to be a master regulator of glioma growth. And we're beginning to unravel the details. We're beginning to understand how it promotes growth and perhaps why it not only promotes growth, but may be necessary for growth. And as we do those basic experiments and as we glean this basic understanding, what is emerging is the idea that this cancer really does not fit the way we think about other cancers and we need a completely new approach to treat it. What's exciting is that we're starting to get some insight into all that we need to learn. I'd like to point out that what we've learned so far tells us not only that neurons and their activity promote the growth of this cancer type, but also that the cancer talks back to the neurons and increases the probability that they will be active. And so this is really a vicious cycle that now we see it and understand it, we can begin to try to disassemble. These tumors are among the worst diseases that affect human beings. We need to make some progress. We need new strategies. We need to be able to provide effective therapies for these children. I think we're on a path that's going to lead us there. I hope that in my career, I see that happen. What we need to do is to root out what appears to be a malignant network while leaving intact the precious network of normal neuronal activity in the childhood brain. It's a big challenge, but um, I think we're, we're starting to make some good headway. There are many people to thank. Um, they have incredible postdoctoral fellows and, and graduate students and Stanford undergraduates in the lab. All of this um, is because of their work. I want to especially thank Hamsa Venkatesh, Aaron Gibson, Anna Garrity, and Chris Mount in the lab. We're enormously grateful to our funding sources. We could not do this work otherwise. And I, I want to just conclude with the idea that none of this would be possible without the children and families whose donation of tumor tissue has enabled this research. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, tremendous. Um, we're going to call uh, Tony up. And I'm also going to just briefly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Kahn, 
who is uh, going to be uh, helping moderate this session, and we'll give him a real proper introduction uh, when he gives his keynote address in just a little while. Uh, Dr. Khan is uh, the director of the Berman Institute at Johns Hopkins, uh, and an ethicist and a public health uh, resource as a, a recipient of an MPH from uh, Johns Hopkins. He's going to help us uh, this morning moderate this, and we'll hear more from him in a little bit. Jeff? Thank you. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure, first of all, good morning and, and wonderful <laughs> to be here um, on the West Coast. Um, it's my, my privilege to moderate the Q&A. I think we're going to try to do this both uh, electronically with the app that we all learned how to use just at the, at the outset. And so I think there's a, a, a plan to have people send their questions, which will be um, screened by Grant, and then we'll have a, an opportunity to poll, and then at some point we'll also um, defer to the old way of having a microphone in the audience and have you ask questions live. So I think that we should just sort of jump right in, right? We see some questions on the screen. Um, what do you see? Can, we, can you see what we see? I'm not sure what exactly they're having a, a look at. I don't think they Maybe can I'll see get it. up and do a little wonder here. Ah, yeah, they see the same thing we do. All right. So, has there been any related research in transferring plasma? Oh, you switched it. <laughs> can we go back to that first one, Grant? Oh, there it is. Has there been any related research in transferring plas plasma from mice with other characteristics, like from an active healthy mouse to a sedentary unhealthy one? Obviously, that's to Tony. I was whispering him, to him backstage, I'm ready for the transfusion myself. <laughs> um, but maybe you can start us off with that. Yeah, so we, we used actually a mouse model for Alzheimer's disease and, and treated these mice with plasma from young, healthy mice and see indeed that there are benefits as well. Um, we haven't really tried too many other models, but uh, what we're doing is discover individual factors and then test these factors in models of disease. And, and I think that the second question was... Um, whether this applies to, to potentially to children. I'm not sure to maternal health, I'm really not an expert, um, but the factors that we see, we start looking now, for example, changes between cord plasma and young uh, people, young adults, and some of these factors are really interesting because they start changing again with age. So they may be involved both in development but then also in degenerative processes. So. Uh, there's the potential that we learn something about these factors and can apply it to, to children as well. Great. And so you sort of gave us a bit of the answer to the second in, in exactly. passing. Uh, all right. So this is obviously to you. So rather than everybody can see the question, I, I don't have to even repeat them out. So why don't we just go straight to <laughs> okay. the... Okay. I think I, I saw several questions about this, and it's a really a critically important question. So what effect on neurological function would targeting neuroligin-3 cleavage and secretion have? Um, we're always worried with, with any cancer therapy that we're going to disrupt normal development or normal neurological function. A convenience um, of this biology is that there's another molecule called neuroligin-1, which is very good at compensating for the function of neuroligin-3 at synapses. When cells lose neuroligin-3, they upregulate neuroligin-1, and that compensate. So the neuroligin-3 knockout mouse is complete, almost completely normal. Um, it, it is the case that only neuroligin-3 but not neuroligin-1 influences glioma growth. And so we can target neuroligin-3 specifically and rely on this compensatory mechanism to sort of continue um, and uh, compensate for the neurological effects. Um, so we think we can, we can specifically target the tumor while allowing normal cells to to proceed with normal function. I also saw a second part of this question, which was what role does neuroligin-3 have on the normal glial cells? And that's actually something we're studying right now. Um, surprisingly, we found that neuroligin-3 was secreted not only from synapses between neurons, but also in, in a fairly important way from the synapses that can form between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Uh, these particular kinds of glial cells are the only glial cell type that are postsynaptic. We don't yet understand what these axoglial synapses do, but they've been well described in the literature for almost 20 years. Um, and, and so OPCs are expressing 
neuroligand-3 themselves. They are secreting it in an activity-dependent way, and we don't yet know what its function is in the normal glial cell. We're, we're studying that right now. So very good questions. Does that, so you, you answered that last one, too? I think I did. Okay. Yeah. So we also have the opportunity for people in the audience to just ask questions directly to, the, to our speakers. Je Jeff, I, I, there's a question uh, while we're waiting for the audience. Right. But I have a, uh, for both uh, speakers, which is y you each, uh, Tony and Michelle, spoke about the language of cells and signal transduction and how cells talk to each other. This is a forward-looking uh, meeting. So I'm wondering if uh, both of you, from your own perspectives, could contemplate what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years relative to cell sensing, cell signaling, how cells speak to one another that's really going to influence your particular work uh, so that you can get a more granular understanding of what you're trying to learn about. I'll start. I think that you know one emerging principle in, in neurobiology in general is that you know we used to think about the neurons communicating with each other and that the other cells were kind of you know, may perhaps listening to the conversation. We now know that this is a um, multicellular and complex conversation with very complex interactions occurring between numerous forms of cells and that these interactions are crucially important to normal function um, as, and, as well as to disease. In addition, I think we're beginning to recognize that the you know, classical way of thinking about communication between cells, which is one cell secretes a molecule that another cell senses, is only part of the picture, and that there are novel modes of communication that are, are beginning to become evident. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, if, sort of in the big picture, I think biologists or, or um, medical doctors went from physiology to start to tease apart what are the actual signals that cells use to talk to each other. Um, and now we have the potential to look at, at least at the, at the nucleic acid level, at a single cell, what does it do and, and what is its profile. I think the future will be to do the same thing at the protein level and really go back then to a physiological understanding, away from one cell talking to another, but to have a comprehensive understanding of the whole body, how different organs communicate with each other, and, and, and starting to measure not just one or 10 or a couple dozen of these factors, but look at the whole uh, context of, of what is the the result of, of all this communication. Those will be very complicated, but um, we're starting to develop the tools to really look at much more than what we were able to do just 10 years ago. So people should raise, ah, there we go. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Doug Judy. I'm a pediatrician, but a lot of my research uh, focuses on health disparities. And I was curious, especially around the, um, the idea of transferring plasma do we run the risk in the future, if therapies come from that, of exacerbating health disparities by making those or having those types of treatments available to the wealthy? I've already heard about clinics that do blood transfusions from young people to older people. How do we, how do we deal with the costs that come from this and the risks of some of these treatments uh, becoming available primarily to the rich? Yeah, that's a great question. As, as you probably know, there are companies that um, collect uh, blood donations from th tens of thousands of individuals on a daily basis. Um, and they c pool these uh, donations and then make blood products that we use in the clinic, whether it's a factor eight or albumin that you would need in a trauma or, uh, or immunoglobulin fractions that are used in autoimmune diseases. Um, so we're working with one of these companies to try to make a fraction of plasma that can be used to treat um, Alzheimer's disease or other age-related diseases. And we have identified such a fraction already, which is now in phase two trials. But um, you're absolutely right. There will not, if this works, there will not be enough plasma likely to treat millions of people. And that's why at the end of my presentation, I showed sort of where we have to go. We have to understand what are the signals that are key to these 
plasma effects. Maybe it's not one factor. I don't think it's one factor. It may be a cocktail, maybe a number of factors. But these factors can be produced uh, in recombinant form synthetically so that we can make unlimited amounts uh, of these factors. And it's also important to note, you, you can't transfuse um, yourself in the kitchen, right? This is very complicated. Uh, you need to have, a, 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 you know, an infusion um, center or something like that. It's, it's not that simple and you need to match the blood type. So I don't think, I mean, I can't exclude there could be a shadow market. Um, but obviously, that's uh, that's what we have to try to prevent and and use legislation and things like that. So so related, there's the question on the screen, Tony, for you, which is sort of the converse of what you were suggesting, right? Is there a, a problem giving old plasma to young patients? That's a really good question uh, that um, I can't answer, unfortunately. But I'm worried that if you would give multiple infusions of the same age plasma, it could be detrimental. I don't think a single treatment or you know, in an acute injury situation where you have to save the life of a patient, that the age of the plasma is really relevant. But, uh, and and it, it ha does not happen in the clinic that you would treat an individual patient just with plasma of the same age. The age of the plasma donation is not considered currently in the clinic, and so you will get randomly younger and older donations. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a big problem. Well, uh, related to that, though, what is a problem is the age of the plasma, how long it's been out on the shelf, so to speak, or out of the patient. Do you think having plasma out of a patient, like so if someone donates it in April, it's stored for a month and a half, and uh, frozen, and then it's given, or I don't know exactly what the blood bank mm -hmm. does, but there are different ages, clearly longer than 21 days. Do you think that makes a difference? So if you get individual blood products, if you get albumin, that is produced, um, so it, it gets donated through actually plasmapheresis, so you take only the liquid part of the blood and the cells go back to the donor, gets frozen immediately at minus 80 degrees, and then gets processed and, and lyophilized and, or frozen again. Um, most proteins are very stable in that context, and we don't really see big differences. Now, there will be individual factors that are affected, but I think that's probably not a big concern. Time for, for maybe one more question. So there's a uh, sorry, question Thank from you. the audience. Thanks. So this is for Tony. Um, so I was intrigued by the fact that when you did your age-related um, study that there were, in fact, differences at, at, at these ages. And I'd like you to think about not just Alzheimer's, but we deal a lot in pediatrics with kids with neuro, other neurodegenerative diseases, often on a genetic basis, but where there might be environmental influences that would affect the rate of neurodegeneration or even the recovery from it. And um, I, I think it would be worth considering and not just giving it to older people, but to some animal models of, of some of the uh, either mitochondrial neurodegenerative diseases or other neurodegenerative diseases that we see in, in children. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for, for making this point. So we, we are actually using, we, we use a model of Niemann-Pick disease. This is a lysosomal storage disease um, that affects children. And we see in this, in this model similar degenerative changes in the brain that you see with aging. Uh, and so we use indeed models like that to see whether we can have an impact on, on these diseases as well, because we, we believe that there are similar mechanisms of degeneration and, and inflammation also in the brain. We have just about one minute left. Okay, quick, quick question. Hi, my name is Sunita, and a um, very interesting <laughs> topic, by the way. Uh, I have two questions. One is that uh, the glio uh, glioblastomas, the growth, uh, you did neuro-optic stimulations and that helped you recognize that there may be uh, the, whatever is those, link <laughs> transmitters. But in normal life, what what is it that causes that thing? I mean, what is the... So 
the different childhood gliomas arise as a result of a cell intrinsic mutation that occurs in some precursor cell. We're still identifying exactly when the mutation occurs. And when that cell is in sort of the wrong place at the wrong time, a tumor begins to take, take place. So you can think of the mutation as a spark, but it needs to have the right kindling in order to really um, alight. And so what we're understanding now is that the, the environment that that spark occurs in very dramatically regulates kind of how, how, how hot that fire is going to burn, how, how vast that so fire is going to be. So is it be. genetically determined or...? Uh... They're not, people are not born with these mutations, we don't think. They're somatic mutations, so they occur okay. not in the germline, but in a particular cell in most cases. There are genetic predisposition syndromes, but mostly what we see are previously healthy children with no genetic predisposition and a tumor emerges at a particular age in a particular location, we think arising from uh, these precursor cells that are actively contributing to a developmental process at that time. Okay, and why I'm asking this is that because I'm from Florida and we have a locale, um, particular geographic uh, zip code where there is an increased predisposition for uh, growth tumors and people are looking at uh, environmental causes for that. So I'm thinking probably this would be a, a good correlation there. My second question was that um, looking at your neuro-optic stimulation, I mean, I'm amazed to see that there is not only a possibility of neuronal activity, increased neuronal activity, but neuronal growth. Do you think in future mental disorders like um, depression and all can be cured um, looking into that? Um, so, you know, in the field, optogenetics has become a really powerful technique, and it's being used to understand the circuit dynamics that contribute to diseases like depression. Um, it's not right now being developed as a therapeutic tool. Yeah. I think we're, oh, we're really out of time. Thank you for those questions, comments. Thank you for, to the panelists. Thank you all for the participation. <laughs>